this sort of expresses what uh, what the place Greenland is like. It's north of here, so far north that the that for months out of the year the sun doesn't shine. It's pitch black at noon, but to make up for it, the wind blows at a hundred miles an hour. Richard Gerald Tesh. I'm a Army veteran from the uh, Cold War. In fact, when uh, I was in the Army, it was the most peaceful time we've had uh, since ever, I guess. You know, it was the period between Korea and Vietnam. So nothing was going on. Thule is way up here above the Arctic Circle, farther north than the Northern Lights. Okay, here's another picture, the relationship between the United States and Greenland. Okay. Greenland is a misnomer. <laughs> it is not green. Oh, this was about 1957. And I was in Greenland for 11 months and 14 days. I uh, was in a uh, Nike Hercules missile outfit. Our job was to stop Russian bombers from coming across the North Pole and bombing America. And I was a panel operator. I pushed the button to send the rockets on the way to blow up the Russian bombers. See, our presence was so intimidating that the Russians never came. <laughs> In the summertime, the sun shone all the time. You know, four months of pure sunshine. You'd get up maybe about, oh, six o'clock and uh, have breakfast. And then you had roll call. We'd line you up and tell you what was going on during the day. And then you'd disperse to your various duties and, uh, Stay there for your for your shift from about four to eight hours, and then, well, you had lunch and supper, and sometimes guard duty, sometimes KP duty, kitchen police. Then at night they show you a movie, like uh, I remember 1953 Dinosaur Chevy shows. Uh, I usually buy a can of planter peanuts, cocktail peanuts at the PX, had a little PX, and watch a movie and eat peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> the wildlife was interesting too. The, the Arctic foxes especially, white little, little about the size of cats. And uh, they would come to the mess hall door and beg for food. And the Arctic hare, which would stand uh, three feet high, and the polar bears, which fortunately stayed outside the wire. You could look down and see Thule Air Base below us and you watch the uh, the fighter jets taking off on practice runs below us. That was, that was quite a sight too. And then if you'd look to the north, there was a fjord and uh, you could see the end of a glacier and you could see icebergs cap, uh, coming off the end of that glacier and falling into the fjord and floating out to sea. And so, it was, it had a beauty, you know, very spectacular. We, we were married at the time, but with no children. And, uh, but uh, we, we thought maybe this would help. Marla's in the background on that shot there. That was a photograph I had on, the, on my desk. 
Well, we couldn't call each other on the phone. I mean, we couldn't do that. So I wrote to him every day. I don't know what I said, but I probably talked about school and what I was doing with those people. And I went to church and I don't know, the days went by. And, but then one night he called. I knew he would be coming home pretty soon. And I got the call. It must have been 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And he said, I'll wait till morning. And I said, no, I'll come get you. I'd never been to Chicago in my life. And we had a little VW. <laughs> I said, I don't know where it is, but I'll get there. Honestly, when I think about it, I don't know how I got there. Because I got in the car. I'd never been in Chicago. I didn't even, I don't think we had freeways. But I got behind the car, and I followed that same car all the way to Chicago. I have no idea what that man thought. But I thought, well, maybe he knows where he's going, and I didn't never turn up. And he went to the airport, too. I have no idea who it was. <laughs> I just followed him. And I drove into the airport and up to this thing, and there was Dick staying there. Oh, yes. It was very different just, just to be able to see something other than ice and snow and uh, to have a sense of freedom and see, see people again, not just the same small group of people for a year. I think one of my statements was, I don't think I want to see any of you ever again. And, <laughs> and I haven't. <laughs> then I decided, since the architect thing was not going to go anything, I discovered that uh, I'm a better artist than I am a mathematician that you have to be when you're an architect. So I decided to go back to UW in Madison and get my teaching degree in art, and which I did. And I taught art for 30 years. And enjoyed almost every minute of it. is a watercolor and I like watercolor because it's quick and it a lot of aspects of it it tends to paint itself like the because I wet the paper down it will flow and blend into various things like the cloud formations right now And so you can do a, a watercolor like this in, uh, you know, less than an hour. You can see when you peel off the, the tape, you get the white, white paper. And that's perfect for birch trees. Well, right now I'm into winter landscapes because I like the <coughs> the white of the paper. Well, you don't have to touch it, and uh, I like the painting the the skies and the water and the and the trees very quickly. Teaching art, you got to uh, do a lot of different media you sort of a jack of all trades we were into linoleum cutting and <clears throat> wire sculptures even book binding thing painting does is it uh, it sort of suspends time. You can spend a couple hours at this and you don't realize that any time has gone by at all. 